Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you right there listening. Thanks to all of you, Kevin Morgan, Paul Thiessen, Ali Sanjabi, and Stephen Fields. On this episode of DTNS, you might be able to replace Google Assistant with ChatGPT soon. Michelle Rahman joins us to explain. Plus, is Substack really a platform? And Tristan Jutra tells us about the ChatGPT of generating songs. Not this song. This was made by you. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, January 5th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. <laughs> Ooh, drawing the te- top tech stories in Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. Uh, from uh, somewhere in Southern California, I'm the show's producer, Roger <laughs> Chang. And joining us, host of AI Name This Show and Momentous Podcast, Tristan Jutra. Welcome back. We're here from the great white north. I'm glad to be here, except it's, it's- just wet. It's not white right now. In the great wet north right now. Okay, fair. You know, it'll freeze eventually, though, if you're not careful. This weekend, apparently. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, Sarah, did you move to a frat? Uh, Sort of. I mean, if you ever want to hang out with my dog and my cat, it feels very fratty. That kind of thing. Especially at about 6.30 in the morning. Yeah! Yeah. (laughs) The animals never fix you breakfast, though, do they? That's what I've found. Never once. Not once. They should get jobs. Seriously. All right. Their job is being cute. That's good enough, I guess. Let's start with the quick hits. We are going to hear plenty about the Samsung Gaming Hub at CES since the company already said it'll be a key feature in its TVs and some of its monitors. The platform lets you easily access game streaming services like NVIDIA GeForce Now, Amazon Luna, Boosteroid, Black Nut, Utomic, and AntStream Arcade, and Xbox Game Pass. It can also stream gameplay to YouTube, Twitch, and Spotify. Sp- Samsung also announced Design for Samsung Gaming Hub. That's for third parties making accessories like game controllers. The First in the program, a gamepad from PDP is available for pre-order now. And while most Bluetooth accessories should work, the designation means it's been tested, it should be compatible, reliable, and secure. We're likely going to hear plenty about Samsung Gaming Hub at CES, since Samsung says it'll be a key feature in its TVs and already has been announced in one of its monitors. The platform lets you easily access game streaming services like NVIDIA GeForce Now, Amazon Luna, Boosteroid. I'm reading the same thing over again, aren't I? I, I, was on the I thought line. I was taking very crazy pills just now. Wow. Uh, yeah, Sarah already told you about that. But maybe you want to order one of those monitors online. Chances are a lot of them came from overseas. So get ready for delays. Maersk, which operates a sixth of global container shipping, is the biggest shipper yet, and not the first, probably not the last, to announce that for the foreseeable future, it will divert its container vessels from its route through the Red Sea and therefore the Suez Canal, to go around the south tip of Africa. Now, you probably already know that's a longer route, but it's at least 10 days long, possibly longer. Houthi military in Yemen have been attacking vessels headed through the Red Sea to the Suez through the Persian Gulf. India and the U.S. are among countries who are providing naval escorts to ships that continue to head to the Suez through the Red Sea. Uh, But it is not yet enough to make the biggest shipping companies on the planet comfortable. So expect delays in shipping over at least the next month. Uh, And more hats to Big Jim for his help understanding this story. Last year, Microsoft surprised and disappointed a lot of folks by discontinuing its popular range of mice, keyboards, and PC accessories, choosing to focus instead on the Surface brand. But a unique partnership with Onward Brands will see Microsoft's PC accessories live on indeed. Onward is licensing the designs of various Microsoft products and then using the same supply chain and manufacturing components as Microsoft. So the products themselves, they're not changing. They'll just now be labeled with Onward's in-case brand, designed by Microsoft. And I will not repeat what Sarah just said this time. Now, you may have been wondering how Huawei was able to put an advanced chip made with a 5 nanometer process into one of its laptops, the L540, given that Huawei is restricted from buying chips made by or with technology from U.S. companies. Well, Bloomberg asked a company called Tech Insights to look at one of those laptops, dismantle it, and figure out who made the chip. Turns out it was TSMC in Taiwan, which no longer makes chips for Huawei. But 
The chip in question was a Kirin 906C made in 2020 before U.S. restrictions forbid TSMC from using U.S.-based technology to make chips for Huawei. So Huawei is just using an old stock of chips. That's what this is. Even though this chip isn't a big example of Chinese chip making prowess, however, uh, remember that Huawei did ship its Mate 60 with a 7 nanometer processor made by Shanghai-based SMIC. When will processors reach the limits of Moore's Law and stop getting faster? You may have asked yourself that very question, perhaps even today. Well, semiconductors are approaching a limit on how small a transistor can physically be made, since you just can't make it smaller than an actual silicon atom. Graphene is one of many possible new materials that could let chips keep speeding up. But despite some scientific breakthroughs in the use of graphene, none have been practical enough or even significant enough to make a widespread replacement. But Georgia tech scientists think they may have unlocked something new. The team published research in the journal Nature on the world's first functional semiconductor made from graphene, detailing something called epitaxial graphene, which they say is compatible with current microprocessing methods, meaning it could be a lot easier for chip companies to actually adopt. I'll believe it when I see it, but uh, it does sound promising yet again for graphing. All right. If you wanted to use chat GPT as the smart assistant on your Android phone, there is some evidence emerging that it might be possible pretty soon. Earlier today, Tom spoke with Michelle Ramon, who published two stories on Android Authority on just this subject. Google Assistant is the default smart assistant on Android. It can be replaced, well, it used to be able to be replaced by Cortana, not anymore so much, uh, but it can be replaced by Amazon, for example. And when you replace it, uh, whatever you replace it with takes over the menu slot. Uh, long press, swipe gestures, things you would normally do to get Google Assistant to come up. You can have another assistant come up in those situations. Michelle Rahman at Android Authority, also found on Android Faithful Podcast, uh, found a new activity in the APK for the version of ChatGPT on Android. Michelle, what did you find? So I was digging through the ChatGPT app and I discovered a new activity, as you mentioned, Tom, called Assistant Activity. And when you launch this activity, which is currently disabled, when you launch it, you get this kind of overlay that appears on screen on any page that you're on. You get this little swirling icon animation, this circle that like gets bigger mm. and bigger. And then as it gets to its maximum size, you're supposed to be able to talk to it. So for those of you who used ChatGPT app before and you've used the new voice mode, um, it'll look exactly like that voice mode um, interface as you're doing it, except this is now in an in animation that appears on any screen. So presumably this will let you activate and talk to ChatGPT from any screen on your phone. You wouldn't have to exit your app, open the ChatGPT app, and then go to the voice mode app and then talk to ChatGPT. You could just summon it from any page that you're on. And that summoning would be made possible by ChatGPT being the default assistant app. And there are further code hints within the app that suggest you'll be able to set it as the default assistant app. And as Tom mentioned, that's something you're already kind of able to do with um, Android. You can change the default assistant app, which on most phones is the Google Assistant. But um, ChatGPT is preparing to add support for being set as a default assistant app. And when it does gain that capability and the user sets it as the default assistant app, you would be able to launch it by doing a long press on the home button, a swipe up gesture from your gesture navigation, or by long pressing the power button. And uh, right now, all three of those actions on most phones either launches the Google Assistant, or if you're on a Samsung phone, perhaps Google uh, Samsung Bixby. So it's not there yet. It looks like they're developing. Uh, what, what's your best guess on on timeline or whether they do this? I think it's a safe bet that they will do this. I don't. I have no idea about timeline, but yeah, yeah. Um, we, we're seeing that Google is developing Assistant with Bard, and they're poised to launch that sometime this year, sometime early, like maybe in the next couple of weeks or months even. And uh, if ChatGPT were to just sit idly by, they'd be losing a lot to Google on this front because Google would provide Assistant with Bard um, right in front of users in a very accessible way because Assistant is already there. You can say the, the naughty... Hot words that I'm not going to say because it'll trigger everyone's <laughs> Nest device right, at home. Right, right. And it'll just bring it up on your phone. Or you could just long press the home button and bring it up. But right now, ChatGPT, accessing it on your Android phone is kind of a hassle because you have to manually open the app or manually go to OpenAI's website to talk to it. That's uh, that's pretty exciting. Uh, I can't wait to, to find out more uh, as, as we learn more. Thank, thanks for uncovering this. Yeah, there is one thing um, 
one caveat about this feature that even if ChatGPT were to roll out support for being set as a default assistant app, that wouldn't give it the same, the full capabilities of what Google Assistant can do. For example, you can launch Google Assistant with the naughty words that I'm not going to say. Right. Um, but you can't do that with third party digital assistant apps that you set through Android because you have to have like privileged access to certain APIs and features that are only available to pre installed apps. And if ChatGPT were to partner with some device makers like, you know, Samsung to have it pre installed and then work with like Qualcomm and stuff to get their whatever hot word they want to use to trigger it um, trained on devices, they could do that. But obviously, that's a lot of work. So um, this other thing that I've actually just coincidentally published today is about a new feature in Android 15 called voice activation. And it looks like this feature will allow you to wake certain um, apps, approved apps, using a uh, voice keyword. And uh -huh. I'm not exactly clear on the full details on how this would work, what kind of uh, voice words would work, or whether or not this will be fully open to third-party apps and whatnot. But I do know that this new API and this capability is being worked on and the full details on that are in my Android Authority article that should be live by the time this is published. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, so go check that out uh, at AndroidAuthority.com, uh, of, of course. Uh, and and you, you've you got code snippets and, and things in the evidence there if people want to take a look at that as well. Anything else uh, you want to mention before we let you go? Yeah, if you want to find out more about what's happening in the world of Android, be sure to check out Android Faithful, which is also part of DTNS um, Network. We go live every week talking about Android with myself, Jason Howell, Win Dow, and Ron Richards. It's a fun time, and next week will be CES, and then the week after that, Galaxy Unpacked, so there's a lot to look forward to in the world of Android. Fantastic. Hey, man, I know it's a busy day for you, especially with two big stories like that coming out, so thanks for taking the time <laughs> to chat with us. No problem. Thanks for having me on, Tom. Well, Tristan, making chat GPT easier to access is a good thing, is, is, isn't it? <laughs> it depends if you want to use it for good or evil. I, I, I have, for one, have been wanting to find a way to make uh, ChatGPT more, uh, especially the voice interface, more accessible from my iPhone. But I've only got an iPhone 14 Pro. But the iPhone 15 Pro has got the action button, which helps make it a little easier. But then I think you still have to maybe have to push the button to activate the voice thing. This Android uh, news is exciting, although I, I can't. It's probably not going to be too long before Google makes it much easier to activate BARD and once they make Google Assistant yeah. smarter with BARD. Um, on, on an iPhone, you could be with, with the, uh, the voice activation. Maybe you could use Siri sh shortcuts. There's a bunch of tutorials on there, which I have not gotten around to trying yet. Um, I, for one, I'm just waiting for Siri to get smarter um, on, on that side of things. And I'm sure people are waiting for Google Assistant and Alexa to get smarter. So as the brains of those assistants get replaced by LLMs, they'll become a lot more useful. But you really need those deep system hooks. As like M Michelle was mentioning, um, they'll be much more useful when you can actually interact with data that's on your phone. Um, once, for me, in the, in the Apple ecosystem, once Siri gets smarter, then it's going to be a Sophie's Choice kind of question. Do I still keep ChatGPT or just go all in with Siri? Yeah, yeah. So, and Weird Ami was saying in our chat, like, oh, great, ChatGPT will be listening. Uh, <laughs> it won't. Android will be listening, though. And Android's already listening. And I think people overreact. It's listening on device. It's pretty well audited. But uh, no, OpenAI won't be the one listening. The, the wild thing is with when you're using the ChatGPT app with voice, um, even if you exit the app and you don't close the session, it actually does keep listening to you. Because every once yeah, in a while, once you've started it, yeah, then, yeah, then all bets are off. That's interesting to know. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Um, but another sort of wrinkle to this whole thing is the, the news that you probably talked about with OpenAI. Um, you know, Sam Altman, you know, talking to Johnny Ive about doing some kind of. AI device. We're not sure what mm -hmm. that looks like, but then with Tang Tam from Apple, who is the head of iPhone design moving over there, yep. could it be a smartphone or are we talking about some other non-smartphone device? Kind yeah, of like thing. an AI pen yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Well, Substack started back in 2017. Remember that year as a platform to manage and grow an email newsletter. Newsletters, they've been around forever, but the most modern version of the newsletters essentially brought back blogging. Instead of having to ping somebody's website all the time or add them to some sort of an RSS reader, their content just 
comes to your email inbox, a thing everybody has and uses, most of us anyway. Substack has now definitely become the current industry standard for newsletters. There there are others, but a lot of people use Substack. But it's also evolved over the last five years. Uh, platformers Casey Newton, platformer, is on Substack, uh, wrote a post on Substack, why <laughs> Substack is at a crossroads. Uh, the point he's making is that it got away with not moderating content at first, and the company has publicly said, yeah, we want to have a hands-off approach to that. And that was okay, again, at first, because all it was really offering was software to publish something. But Tom, Substack is different now. It's got yeah. recommendation engines. You know, there are there's stuff that comes to my inbox of writers that I might want to discover that I don't know, and I might not necessarily like. Yeah, I'm I'm of the opinion that Substack can't, is trying to play both sides of of an aisle that that people don't like you to be on both sides of these days. Uh, I'm fine with a Cloudflare kind of thing, which is what Casey uh, compares it to, or even WordPress, where you say we're the platform, you pay us to use the platform, and that's it. Uh, everything else is up to you, right? And we'll provide you tools and all of that, but we're not picking winners or losers. Uh, that's how Substack started, as you mentioned, but now they have become someone who recommends things. They send out a newsletter. They surface algorithmically newsletters you might like based on the ones that you're subscribed to. So you are now not only engaged in recommending content and promoting content, they're also monetizing it uh, by providing the promotion of subscriptions and paid subscriptions and things like that. I have the Tech Tom newsletter at techtom.substack.com. It's free once a week, but you can pay every day. And Substack is an essential part of that. So when you're monetizing and you're promoting, suddenly people put you on the hook for a lot more moderation. And I think Substack has to pick a lane, either take responsibility for the platform and not say, hey, if it's legal, it can be here uh, because people don't like that. Uh, they're they're going to get in trouble if they do that mm -hmm. or go back to just being a more neutral platform. Tristan, where do you fall in this? Well, one of the dangers, I guess, of starting to do things like uh, using recommendation engines and or and or manually moderating is you start getting into Section 230 territory, if I'm not mistaken, whereby you're not simply a, a, a platform anymore, you're a publisher, and then you face additional scrutiny. And I think that's one of the reasons why Substack was trying to be hands off. But again, like you said, they, they can't have it both ways. Uh, I, for one, I, I subscribe to a number of Substack newsletters, most of which I actually consume via RSS, so because my inbox email inbox is too full as it is. But I've noticed that some newsletters I subscribe to have now started bailing from Substack, those who have a particular uh, political viewpoint. And you know the same kind of people probably that have left Twitter as well, maybe for similar reasons. They don't like the company that they're keeping on those platforms. Yeah. yeah. And real quick, Section 230 uh, protects your ability to moderate and be a publisher. So they, they would be clear under that. They'd be okay with that. Yeah, but to your point, Tristan, uh, Casey Newton uh, wrote, he, he said, I'm considering leaving Substack. He didn't, you know, this wasn't a flounce out uh, post, but saying, you know, I've, I've got folks who ha had said, hey, it's not you, it's Substack, but I'm not going to pay for anything on Substack anymore. And that includes your newsletter, which is a very good newsletter. And, you know, that as a content creator... Um, you know, this is not apply to Substack, but especially when you get into monetization and especially when the company is taking a cut of that monetization, no matter what you're saying, that's where I think it becomes a very sticky situation. Does a company say, we don't want to have to draw the line. We want to stay out of it. Of course, that's way easier. But if you lose, um, folks who would otherwise be very loyal to your platform and the folks that want to be on your platform, I don't know. I, I don't I don't think that there's a clear path towards uh, harmony here. Well, but if we're all about helping people understand the part of that means putting yourself in the shoes of somebody they may disagree with. And I think Substack's take on this is we're not going to promote the content you don't like. Right. We're going to shut down illegal content. So forget about that. But the content that you're like, you shouldn't be involved in promoting it. We're not going to promote it. We're not going to recommend it. Uh, and yes, they can monetize through our tools like everybody else, but we're not going to do anything to help them succeed. Uh, and so your complaints, you know, your pushback 
are the thing that that is going to stop them from being successful, not us banning them from the platform. At least that seems to be Substack's message so far. So they're doing the whole freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom of reach sort of approach that pretty uh, much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's all, as long as they don't eventually go tell their customers to go F themselves. Then yeah, I don't okay. see them carrying kitchen sinks around or anything <laughs> like that. So it's it's limited in similarities to others. You may have said uh, say that sort of thing. Uh, we all love a failure. Um, this has nothing to do with the story we were just talking about. Uh, it's just happens to be the theme of this week's top five at youtube.com slash daily tech news show. Uh, if you want to get the top five tech fails as determined by the internet in a totally not scientific survey, uh, go check it out. You can catch it at youtube.com slash daily tech news show. Back in December, Microsoft's Copilot began to integrate with the AI music tool Suno AI. The plugin lets you write a text prompt to generate music, including vocals and accompaniment. You can create the whole song, just tell it what to do, and it creates the whole song for you. Uh, however, the plugin version of this only gives you one result per prompt. Suno's Discord offers two. Uh, Tristan, do you think Suno.ai is properly described as the chat GPT of generative AI music? Well, I think it'd be uh, catchy to say that, but honestly, I think it's more like the Dali of, mm, of, mm -hmm. uh, generative, uh, okay. of generative music in that it's kind of a niche. More people are going to want to interact with the large language models, whereas fewer people are using the image generation capabilities of Dali 3. And I think even fewer people, again, would be wanting to use the generative music capabilities of Suno as uh, a plug-in into um, uh, Microsoft Copilot, like you can, you know, have being image generator as part of Copilot and all these other things. So it's 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 a bit more of a specialty thing, a bit more of a niche, and it's an interesting product of the last few years of all sorts of advancements happening in generative uh, AI generative music, like we've seen with the large language models and the 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 um, the, the text, uh, sorry, the image generation as well. These are all kind of been developing in parallel because a lot of them share similar uh, technologies on the back end, such as uh, GPT-2 back in the old days when this, some of the stuff was getting going. And they, they've continued to increase at a remarkable uh, pace, improve at a remarkable pace. So there's been a number of issues uh, that have come up over the last uh, year, especially uh, with, to do with music. You know, we've seen copyright issues due to, um, you know, large language models scraping song lyrics. Yeah, Universal mm -hmm. was, was suing Anthropic over that. We've seen uh, some of these higher quality uh, music generation tools and combined, being combined with artificial streaming uh, services to game Spotify. So people like just crank out all sorts of generative music and then use these other services to get uh, stream plays on Spotify to, to make a bit of money. And Spotify has been clamping down on that. And then we've seen um, some, uh, there was a tool called Boomi that people were using uh, to make some of those songs. And then in the spring, we saw a number of AI uh, voice models being applied to things like um, you know Ad Adele songs and Gautier songs and uh, the song Hey, Le hey There, Delilah, all these songs being sung by Kanye and other people like Johnny Cash and, and whatnot. And then we also had the the the, the quote-unquote Drake and the, the Weekend song yeah. that uh, was done by Ghostwriter777 that caused a big flurry and that because that got onto Spotify and other services. So <laughs> Universal Music Group had to, had to clamp down on that. And then there's some artists... Um, such as uh, such as Grimes that were just like leaning into it and making their voice print. Uh, hers is called uh, Elf Tech Grimes AI One Voice Print, and saying, "Hey, go ahead and make music using my voice. Um, I just want a cut." And then mm -hmm. you've got a band. Uh, there's a band called AISIS, which did uh, something called the the Lost Tapes, and they made basically an Oasis album, which li live uh, uh, Vo instruments, but they replaced their singer's vocals with a voice model of Liam Gallagher from <laughs> Oasis, and it's amazing. It's the it's the missing Oasis album from the '90s that you wow. that you always wanted but never got. So a lot of this act there's this all flurry of activity happening in the spring, and they've got a second album coming soon, by the way. But so th this is causing so many issues the, with all these tools. Um, apparently, there's this, this underground like black market for leaked Harry Styles and One Direction songs, but 
this whole black market is being polluted by AI generated mm-hmm. versions of songs by these artists as well. So that is kind of just like a background for 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 that um, because the, these tools, like a couple of years ago, were kind of garbage, sloshy, no real melodies or uh, inconsistent beats. Vocals were in, indiscernible, but we've seen uh, a number of tools like um, uh, Bored Humans. I was using a GPT-2 model and they on their website, boredhumans.com, there's a bunch of samples that they provided. Uh, Google has a Music LM, which uh, was an open source um, model to, being, uh, to create music. And then there was like SoundDraw.io, which has all sorts of great tools there. But with Suno.ai, it's based on a universal text-to-audio model created by Suno called Bark. So that is something that other people can tap into. And they've got their own public-facing app now at Suno.ai, so you can you can mess around with. And like you said, there that's now a plugin for Microsoft Copilot. But it, there are some limitations, as you mentioned, but then you say, oh, please make me a longer version. I want something longer than a minute. And it'll basically give you the freemium message. Oh, if you want to yeah. do, you know, go, go to the Suno.ai site. So it's a little bit different um, than, than Dolly in that respect, but similar uh, as well. It's, so it's, uh, the, the folks who started Suno AI are uh, alumni of uh, com- companies like Meta and TikTok. So they've got some tech bona fides there, but it's... It's the, the you, you not only does it create the music for you, you just it's just like text to music. So you describe the kind of song you want. It'll generate the music. It'll create lyrics, and it'll also do the vocals. And it sounds almost like a real song. It's not a hundred percent, but this is great for ideation. And you know, it's going to be a little while before we're, this is going to be on the on the radio, if that still exists. Or, or <laughs> <laughs> but I tried a bunch of uh, different uh, styles. Sometimes it doesn't get what you mean by certain styles necessarily, especially if things are a bit more off the beaten path. But the results are fascinating. I've got a uh, an example here from The Verge uh, when they wrote this up in December. Uh, write a song about cats in the style of cat power. Because and, internet. Yeah. We- I mean, that may not be your style of music, but it's not bad, right? If you're having trouble sleeping, yeah. <laughs> it it is in the style of cat power if yeah. you're familiar with her you know it's kind of kind of moody indie you know down tempo yeah. stuff i like I, it i've seen this become common in k-pop where there's there's two big girl bands from hive uh la seraphim and new jeans and regularly people put up on youtube youtube if la seraphim sang omg if New Jeans sang Eve Psyche and the Bluebeard's Wife. Like it's just become normal to be like, oh yeah, somebody's going to play around and have one group sing another group's thing. What, what, go ahead, Sarah. What, what was the uh, the artist? Now, of course, it's escaping me now. But it, it, he it was a DJ who was like famous for like mashing up a bunch of songs and making. Uh, oh gosh, I can't remember. I actually didn't really like his style that much, but. The whole concept of the mashup thing I find fascinating now because it's like, let's mash up with this tool. Just see what we get. Might be garbage, might be cool. You know, let's do it because we can. Whereas before, you couldn't make Kanye West sing a song that he didn't want to sing. Well, these sorts of tools really democratize, for lack of a better word, and open up the, the being able to create music to regular folks. And the results are, I think, going to you know vary wildly. It's one of those things where it's garbage in, garbage out. If you, uh, if you give good detailed prompts, you're probably going to get more satisfactory results. If you give vague prompts, it's probably going to give you not quite what you're looking for. What I found in my experimentation so far, and I've thrown things at it like Britpop and sort of industrial, you know, d- and dark techno and all sorts of things. And it's, especially with the poppy stuff, d- to your point tom a lot of it ended up sounding like k-pop was my my wife stephanie was commenting he's like that, that sounds more like k-pop than Britpop." it's like okay well maybe it depends on what they're 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 training these models on sometimes mm. if you ask for certain styles artist styles it'll it'll reject it because like we're seeing with dolly and their tools um there's a bit of uh cautiousness regarding actually deliberately using other artist styles for fear of litigation all right. Uh, well, go check out uh, AI Named This Show if you want more of these kinds of discussions and insights on what's going on with AI. Tristan and Tasia do a great job with that, available in podcatchers everywhere. Uh, let's finish up with a check of the mailbag. There's an old friend in there. Yeah, 
Yeah, in fact, oh, by the way, Girl Talk. That's the artist I was thinking of. Ah, nice. you remembered. Good, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you sat around with your family over the holidays drinking eggnog, doing whatever you do, you might have thought to yourselves, you know what would make this even better? If we were back in the days when the Concorde crossed the Atlantic at supersonic speeds. Remember those days? Weren't they grand? Well, Chris Christensen has some news that may interest you. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. If you always felt like you missed out on your chance to fly on the Concorde or to fly at supersonic speeds, NASA is working on bringing that back as a reality for commercial air travel. They have a new program called Quest, the Quiet Supersonic Technology Program. The big problem we had with the Concorde in the U.S., for instance, they weren't allowed to fly over land because of the big sonic boom they left behind. And what this program is working on is planes that would travel between Mach 2 and Mach 4 versus current airlines would travel at about 80% of the speed of sound, but have a much diminished sonic boom when they pass mm -hmm. over. You can't eliminate it completely, but if you can do away with that objection, then maybe we could have commercial supersonic flight again. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Ooh, a sonic whisper. I like it. Mm -hmm. And I like the speed, too. So, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's all very interesting. Thank you, Chris Christensen. And thank you, Len Peralta, who has been busy illustrating today's show. What have you drawn for us today, Len? Uh, you know, I didn't get a chance to play around with Suno AI, although I find that fascinating that uh, we're at this stage in humanity where, a, uh, where, where an AI model can write a song. It's just amazing to me. But I did go on to ChatGPT and asked it to write the chorus for an upbeat, poppy pop song. And uh, that's kind of what I drew here. The lyrics are, we're dancing through the neon lights, soaring through the city heights. In the rhythm, we find our way, living for the night and the music sway. So that's pretty amazing. You know, personally, nice. I'll just I'll just stay with my own art um, and, uh, and and kind of generate my own art here. So, um, you know, that's that's kind of where I'm Len, kind of Len, I'm, I'm looking at your art and I know people on the audio podcast can't see it, but it look, looked quite a bit like Mickey Mouse to me. I don't know what you're talking about. That's my yeah, the, original the, piece of the art. The Mickey Mouse from Steamboat Willie that just went into the public domain. We talked it about that. It does look remarkably before. like Mickey Mouse. No, yeah. I don't. I don't know what you mean. Um, it's. It's. I. I. That's my original piece. So uh, I. Huh. I don't know. I maybe Crazy it looks like somebody else's stuff. But I mean, you do have your know. signature, so I guess it is yours. It is. You mine. were yeah. trained on public domain art, though. So yeah. I was. Yes. If you'd like to see this piece of art, as long along with the uh, the chat. GPT written poppy course. You can go to my online store uh, or, or Patreon, patreon.com uh, uh, forward slash Len, where you can uh, join me at the DTNS lover level and you get this great original piece of art. Uh, you can also uh, go to my online store, uh, lenperaltastore.com, where uh, you can order some stuff from DTNS or also try to commission me for something. So, yeah, go ahead, do it. You can do it, it's possible. Well, thank you, Len, and also thank you to you, Tristan Jutra. Let folks know where they can keep up with you when you're not uh, doing really good work for us on this here show. Well, you can uh, tune in at 7 p.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays for Momentous Live, and of course we get the audio version of that, which uh, goes out every week. And then on Fridays midday, Tasia and I publish our podcast, AI Name This Show, which you can find at AINamethisShow.com. Fantastic. Uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show Good Day Internet. If you're a patron, you get more good stuff. We're going to take a quick look at what folks expect from CES next week and then have another round of Tech Riddle of the Sphinx because it's Friday and we like to have a little fun. Can you deduce the answer before anyone else does? Just a reminder, we are live on the show. You can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live next week is ces week we are coming in hot all week we'll be doing ces coverage hope to see you there this show is part of the frog pants network get more at frogpants.com the dtns family of podcasts helping each other understand
This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lang. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host Rob Dunwood. Video producer and Twitch producer Joe Kuntz. Technical producer Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott S1, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom Merritt. Contributors for the Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows include Nika Monfort, Scott Johnson, Chris Ashley, Justin Robert Young, and Chris Christensen. And our guests this week, with Tristan Jutra and Michelle Rahman. Thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. Yeah.